There's absolutely no shame in using medication, long-term or short-term. And I think that your partner should take that even as a compliment, right? That they are important enough for you to go on medication to facilitate your sexual relationship. That's pretty awesome. That's like, that's like a big leap and it's not convenient for you and you're willing to do that. So I think that's cool. Hey, everybody. Before we start the show, I want to make a couple disclaimers. This show does cover a wide variety of topics related to mental health and life in general, and some of those could be sensitive for you. I want to simultaneously encourage you to be brave in consuming difficult content, but also respect and recognize your limitations. So please use your best judgment. I will never be offended if you need to skip a question or an episode entirely, but feel free to feel it out, check out the episode, and just see what happens. If you need to skip, that's okay, but you know, feel free to give it a shot first. I also need to say that while I am a psychologist, I'm not your psychologist, and I'm not your therapist. This is not intended to be direct medical advice, and you should not use this as a substitute for professional help. So with those said, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right. Hello, friends of all varieties. This is the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast, episode 286. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Duff, aka Duff the Psych. I make mental health content for real people, just like you. And I have a question and answer episode today. Um, Two really good questions. One about uh, taking time off and having anxiety about it. One about uh, erectile dysfunction, actually. So a couple different types of questions, but I like having a variety. So thank you for that. If you want to send me a question to answer on the show, please shoot me an email, duffthepsych at gmail.com. That's the best place for me to find questions. And as I said last time, I've been getting a lot of good ones. So thank you for that. Appreciate you all. Um, I am a little bit worn out today. I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear it in my voice, but um, man, <laughs> I made a blunder this morning. It actually, everything worked out well. It worked out perfectly in terms of time and stuff like that, but it nearly could not have. Usually when I have a uh, neuropsych testing cases. I start them at like nine o'clock in the morning. This one happened to be at 10 because it was farther away. It was a home visit. And I forgot to pack all my stuff, like all my testing materials and everything when I was at the office yesterday. So basically what I had to do is wake up, uh, get everybody ready, take the kids to school, and then go drive like 40 minutes south to get to my office go pack up everything, all my materials and things that I needed, and then drive like another like hour plus north to get to the home that I was going to. So it was a lot of wasted time and I felt like a dummy for it, but I actually got there right on time. And then, you know, I finished up the the case and came back home, did a therapy session, basically right on time with that too. So everything worked out, but it's been like a back and forth, like go, 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 go sort of day. So I'm a little bit worn out from all of that, but you know, do it okay overall. Um, the case itself was an interesting one. Um, I don't know if you guys care to hear about this, but a, a lot of times when I talk about like my real job, people find it interesting and and I get feedback for it. So it was a, uh, a capacity case, meaning somebody's uh, capacity to engage in, there are different types of capacity, medical or financial. In this case, it was financial. So is this person capable of uh, participating in financial agreements? And uh, the reason being was their family basically needed to um, move funds around, do a a reverse mortgage on their house to help pay for their care. And uh, they needed to do some sort of like phone screening thing. And and they didn't have, well, seemed to not have the capacity to participate in that. So their power of attorney needed to come in and uh, get me to assess them so that they could get around that and, and help them out, which... I feel a lot of sympathy for because that's a whole lot of fucking hoops to jump through. I feel bad for the family and all of that, but it's also good to to get a get some eyes on the person and and check things out and make sure that they're safe. And that's part of what I do is you know um, evaluating capacity isn't always just to take away someone's rights. It's to make sure that they're safe and that they're be able to be taken care of in the right sort of way. Um, one interesting thing about capacity, if you guys ever run into this. Uh, it's not necessarily tied to things like dementia. Like you can have a dementia condition and still have legal capacity because it's not affecting you in that sort of way. On the flip side, you could have, say, a stroke or a brain injury and lack a specific type of skill, like, say, uh, your reasoning abilities, you know, your problem-solving abilities, and they're so bad that it really impacts your ability to function in this specific realm. 
But in general, maybe you don't have dementia. Maybe you are actually operating pretty fine in everyday life and not really functionally impaired, but just in a specific way, you would not have capacity. So they're not always tied together, just so you know. You know, somebody can have lack capacity while still doing pretty well overall and vice versa. So that is the random tidbit from my uh, neuropsychology life. Thank you for letting me nerd out for a second. I hope that you guys are treating yourselves very well. Why don't we go ahead and jump into the first question here? All right, so first question reads, Hi, Robert. I have a potential question for the podcast about increased anxiety around having free time off work. Question, I often find myself feeling exhausted or burnt out from working and just being busy with life. However, I experience a lot of anxiety about having free time. Despite feeling exhausted, I avoid taking my vacation time and find myself dreading long weekends because my anxiety tends to increase when I have extra unscheduled time. I was wondering if you have any tips about how I can get to a place where I can find peace and enjoyment with simply relaxing. Thanks so much for taking the time to read my question. And then there are some personal notes uh, just thanking me and saying that it encouraged them to go back to therapy, which is awesome. Also, I purchased your online course with conjunction with therapy. Awesome. Thank you for the feedback. Appreciate you. And uh, thank you for the question. So yeah, um, I think this is a super common issue and totally normal. So uh, let's get into it a bit. I, I can definitely relate to this myself. Um, I totally need time off. I can recognize that. And I've been better at recognize, recognizing that you know, over the, the recent years. But I also can, you can ask my wife about this. I do get super restless and agitated and sometimes don't know what to, what to do with myself when I actually do take that time off, you know, unless I'm like off on a vacation and totally away from everything. It can be like uh, just another normal work day for me or something like that. So as I said, I think a lot of this is totally normal and it's kind of tragic when you actually think about it. Like when you think about the fact that this is sort of uh, basically driven by capitalism. Um, and it's also a lens that's very ableist, meaning rest is not like just a form of recreation for a lot of people. It's a necessary part of them being able to function and survive. And they should be able to rest way more than they do already without feeling inherently guilty about it, let alone feeling guilty any time rest or unstructured time is present. So if you really take a step back, it's kind of gross, right? The need for money and, um, you know, to, to be able to make ends meet and all of that really drives a lot of guilt. And, and when you think about where that comes from, it's, that it's not like some, you know, universal moral obligation. It's, it's driven by, you know, money. And that's, that's kind of icky. Uh, well, I think it is at least. <laughs> um, for you, I think that uh, one sort of mindset shift you can make is realizing that resting and recharging is not wasting time. That it's actually part of productivity. It's an investment in your future productivity, right? I've talked about this before, but it's it's definitely something that is an investment in your future self. Uh, you mentioned already that you know you've been struggling with feeling exhausted or burned out, and we like to think that we can push through anything, and in some ways we can. You know, humans are really resilient, and there's a lot that we can push through. There's a lot that we can tolerate if it comes down to it. Um, but if I were to do some sort of, you know, controlled study, uh, like a research study on you and look at your output and also quality of work over time, I would most certainly see that you do better work when you're rested and not stressed out. That's just how we work. You know, I mean, at, at a very basic neurobiological level, if our, if our limbic system, you know, our amygdala, the part of our brain that has to do with stress and the fight or flight response and anxiety, if that's, you know, flooding the part of our brain that uses uh, complex logic, then we have less room to think about complex logical things like work. So it just sort of makes sense, right? Um, and so you definitely do better work when you are rested, when you're well rested, when you're not feeling anxious or stressed out. So it's actually productive and necessary to get rest. It's better for you to do four hours of just solid, well-rested work than eight to 12 hours of distracted, sad, lousy, you know, unproductive work. Um, you can probably push through those eight hours or those 12 hours, but why do that when you have a different option? So if you find yourself uh, making these self-judgments, you know, having this, this weird moral sense that you have to work, that work is contributing to your feelings of anxiety and such, you know, needing to work more rather, you know, the feeling that you need to work more is contributing to your feelings of anxiety and such. Try to remind yourself of this, 
you know, that you are doing the right thing, um, even if you do view it through that capitalist lens, even if your responsibility here is to do more work, to be a more productive worker, to have more output, even if you view it through that lens, which I said is pretty ableist, um, even through that lens, you're doing the right thing by resting because you're actually increasing the quality of your work. You're going to be doing better work. It's just like a, it's just like uh, machines and maintenance, right? If you have a, a warehouse that's full of robots, you know, like Amazon, if you work them endlessly and don't do any calibration, don't do any maintenance, don't do anything related to upkeep, that's not going to be better in the end, even though you might have a short-term boost in productivity in the long run, that's going to screw things up because stuff's going to break down. It's going to cost more to fix it, yada, 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 right? Same thing here. Hey friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right, this episode is brought to you by Chomper Labs. Hey, did you know that about 15% of the population grinds their teeth? That's a lot of people, and that's even a conservative estimate. It's a, it's a big deal, and uh, I have been lucky enough myself to mostly avoid teeth grinding, but there's a lot of people in my family that do it, and I know it's, it's pretty horrendous, both for the person and anybody that has to listen to it. Um, but studies have shown that the biggest culprit behind teeth grinding is stress and anxiety. And I know if you're listening to this show, there's a good chance that that's something that you, you know, have some experience with, especially over the past couple of years. So it seems like the number of teeth grinders is on the rise. Um, and if you've ever had a night guard of any kind, you know there's basically two options. You have pay hundreds of dollars for a night guard from a dentist or get a cheap one from the drugstore that just doesn't fit well or work. So Tromper Labs is intended to give you an option that's the best of both worlds. Custom made night guards that are the same quality as the dentist, but at a fraction of the cost. Their night guards are custom fit to your teeth for an exact perfect fit. And they have a range of options for every type of grinder. So from soft to hard, light to heavy grinding. Um, they also have other types types of guards as well. So if you need more of like a retainer type, they have that as well. Um, so the experience doesn't have to be painful. With Chomper Labs, it's pretty easy, fun, friendly, affordable. Everything's done from the comfort of your home. You just go online. You get a kit to make a mold of your teeth from home. You send that in. You send in your teeth impression. And then you get a perfectly fitting custom night guard delivered straight to your door. This starts with a 60-second quiz on the website to get your personalized recommendation of which night guard will be best for you. And uh, they have great customer service every step of the way. They'll even review pictures of your impressions before you send it in. So, you know, if there's anything that goes wrong there, they'll help you out. If it's uh, not a good fit, they will adjust or remake your night guard entirely with free three-way shipping. So really low, low risk there. They also accept uh, health savings accounts and flexible savings accounts. So don't wait to protect your teeth from grinding, get relief from your headaches, get a better night's sleep, all of that good stuff. Visit chomperlabs.com slash duff. So C-H-O-M-P-E-R labs, L-A-B-S, chomperlabs.com slash duff, D-U-F-F. And you can get $15 off your first night guard with the code duff. And again, you get that free three-way shipping, low risk. Go check them out, chomperlabs.com slash duff. All right, back to the show. And I think that for being able to rest, you might need to intentionally put some work in, in terms of getting used to it, you know, um, it, it doesn't feel like your natural state right now. And that's okay. I think it's worth it to do a little bit of deprogramming here to really try to learn how to get better at relaxing. For you, I think that one way you might be able to sort of backdoor your way into intentionally relaxing is to do things like put it on your calendar right? Like literally in your you know Gmail calendar or if you use paper or whatever, block off a few hours over the weekend to intentionally focus on relaxation. And it, this, is, this is sort of acknowledging that it may be a little bit less the relaxation part itself that's difficult for you, but more the lack of structure, right? I think you even mentioned that. Yeah, extra unscheduled time you said in your question. So the lack of structure might be something that kind of drives you crazy, whereas, you know, you can relax or you can engage in different activities that you prefer but you just sort of don't, don't know what to do with yourself. You are definitely allowed to do activities and things, um, but it might be that you need to give yourself a little space and a little bit of time to think about it and sort of set yourself up. Um, I, like I said, I, I really do identify with this question because I have to do a little bit of this for myself. Um, I've definitely been known um, on probably most weekends to outline my days still. I usually, you know, Saturday and Sunday, like I'll wake up, I'll grab some coffee and do a Sudoku or something like that for just, you know, um, stimulation and relaxation and all of that. I'll do a little Sudoku and then I'll sit down and I'll write out what I want to do with that day. I'll pull out my notebook and 
um, I'll write down what my plan is. And this is broad. You know, I don't go hour by hour by hour unless it's that kind of day. <laughs> but in general, um, you know, I just might write down things like, okay, I'm going to try to take the boys to the park, uh, do some housework, you know, whatever that might include. If there's projects that I need to get done, uh, probably some gaming time in there, uh, a run or any other form of exercise I want to do. Um, and then during that period of time when I'm sort of outlining my day, I also might like uh, brainstorm things like uh, what are some movies that I might want to watch tonight or, you know, other activities, things we haven't done in a while, maybe where we want to go for dinner, things like that. And, and just sort of thinking ahead so that I don't have to be um, paralyzed by decision fatigue or just feeling aimless in the middle of the day or in the evening. And this is how I do it. It doesn't have to be how you do it. It's a very different way from the way that my wife does things. <laughs> she would never do something like that unless it was like she's on her own. She's got both the kids. There's a lot of stuff going on and she needs to stay on the ball, like around a holiday or something like that. Then she might outline the day <laughs> in that sort of way. But otherwise, no, that's not how she does things. That's just how I do it. So whatever works for you is okay to each their own. Um, but I think I tend to be more like you in this way. So I understand that rest and uh, intentionally doing non-work things is necessary, but being aimless is always a little bit hard for me. So like I said, you, you're allowed to do activities, but one thing you might do is think about switching the focus. Um, the weekend is a great time, or any time off, you know, vacation, extended weekend, what have you. Um, these are great times for adventures, uh, doing things unusual or going out of your way to do something, or personal development. Um, I tend to do a lot more of my like nonfiction reading on the weekends. Uh, so like this past Sunday, you could have catch me on the front porch with a cocktail, watching the kids play out front and reading books on dog training and also on eating disorders. <laughs> I know a wide subject matter there, but um, yeah, you know, that was sort of my Sundays are like my review day. So I'm just trying to learn and review things and, and kind of nourish my brain. And so you know, a little bit of both. I was kind of killing two birds with one stone. And uh, I think that the weekend is a great time for shifting from your work work to your personal work. Nothing wrong with that. Um, so for you, maybe this is a time to watch a documentary you've been meaning to take in or uh, start an online class. You know, if you're on Masterclass, for instance, you know, you can browse on there, find some stuff you want to learn. Uh, an in-person class, you know, if those are if a thing still. Uh, maybe it's time to finally try that axe throwing thing that people are doing these days or go drive to a restaurant you've been craving that you saw on Instagram. You know, you don't have to just sit and do absolutely nothing. That's not, that's not something you have to do. You can. You absolutely can if you want to. There's nothing wrong with just sort of handling the minimum around the house and what you need to get done and then just binging the crap out of a show on your favorite streaming platform. That's totally fine too if that's what you want. But if that is just so far out of your wheelhouse that it makes you feel icky and, and itchy and uncomfortable, you know, I think there's, it's kind of half and half. You want to practice being able to sit and just, you know, enjoy yourself and, and build a little bit more tolerance for that, um, which kind of sounds silly. I, I think that, yeah, as I said, you need some practice at this and it might sound silly to get better at tolerating free time, um, but that's kind of what you need to do. And, you know, if you want to add some activities in there, you know, use the tips that I said of, of, of trying to do things that are maybe a little bit more um, self-development related or adventure, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, you know, in, in tolerating the free time, in learning how to relax more, remind yourself that it's okay, that you're not doing anything wrong, that in fact you are doing something right. And uh, if you find yourself getting frustrated about it, you know, try to reorient yourself to that. Give yourself a little pat on the back. Say, okay, hey, you're doing a good job. You're doing your part. You're trying to be good to yourself. You're investing in your future work, and that's what you should be doing. And then, you know, just try your best to get back to enjoying yourself. And over time, it will become easier. Um, the other thing is that, you know, you don't need to beat yourself up for not relaxing in the right way, right? Air quotes there, the right way. Um, even if you spent all of Saturday driving yourself crazy because you're just feeling restless, guilty, like you should be doing something else, that's still okay. You didn't do anything wrong. Um, you can have compassion for yourself knowing that you were kind of stressed out, like that that was a maybe a harder day for you, but you don't need to feel guilty about it. You still didn't do your work work and that's a good thing. And you're just trying to let your brain adjust to that. So it's not always going to be, you know, the most pleasant day ever, but it will get better if you allow yourself to start easing into it and, um, you know, trying to train yourself to do better with it. I haven't talked about the uh, best friend trick in a while on the show, but this is something that you could definitely use in this situation to help ease your guilt and your discomfort. 
the the best friend trick is when you imagine that your best friend or a family member or somebody that you care about, um, they were in the same exact situation. So you imagine that person, somebody that, you know, you would, you're on their side, you know, and so you picture them in your exact situation. They're free for the weekend. They're feeling anxious and guilty, twitchy because they feel like they should be working and uh, they don't know what to do with themselves. And so when you picture them in that situation, you know, trying to close your eyes and really imagine it, do you apply the same harsh judgments to them that you apply to yourself? You know, most often the answer is going to be no, that you don't do that, that you, you know, have compassion for them. You know, you think they deserve to rest. You think it's a good idea that they're not doing anything wrong, that they're not being lazy or not lazy in a problematic way, at least, um, and all of that, you know, so you're usually not going to be such an asshole to them in the way that you would to yourself. And so using that uh, best friend trick can be helpful when you catch yourself falling into these uh, unproductive thinking patterns. When you're applying those judgments to yourself, you back up a little bit try out that best friend trick and see if that is one way that you can sort of reorient reorient yourself back to, you know, the reality of the situation, which is, yeah, it might be a little uncomfortable for you, but it's still the right thing to be doing and you're not doing anything wrong and you're making an investment in yourself, trying to take good care of yourself. Um, Another thing that I haven't talked about in at least a couple episodes here is mindfulness meditation. Um, Mindfulness meditation is one of my favorite coping skills. It's sort of a um, when you apply sort of the 80, 20 principle, right? What is that called? Is that, that's not, that's not Hashimoto's. No. What is it? Uh, Pareto's principle. I think I, I could be wrong. Somebody correct me. I think it's Pareto's law or Pareto's principle or something. 80, 20, basically you want to find the, the 20% of things, 20% of, um, activities or coping skills in this case, other cases it might be applying to business or writing or whatever, but the 20% of things that make 80% of the difference. And, Mindfulness fits really well into that 80-20 analysis because, um, you know, mindfulness is one of those things that's a force multiplier. It really, really helps in a variety of areas and it makes other things easier. So by sticking with a consistent mindfulness practice, you can learn to better tolerate uncomfortable feelings and, you know, uncomfortable emotions more readily without them fully consuming you. So essentially what you do is you get better and better at noticing these things And then just allowing them to sort of peacefully exist in the background among your other thoughts and other feelings because they're no different. So you're kind of defusing yourself from those thoughts and those feelings and letting them just, uh, you know, have that moment of recognition. You're not pretending like they're not there. So when you have those harsh judgments or you feel like, oh, I should be doing something else. I should be doing this. I should be doing that. You don't go, oh, don't think that. That's dumb. Don't think that. You know, (laughs) you just say, okay, I'm being harsh on myself here or not even put that quality judgment. Just say, Okay, I'm telling myself that I'm doing something wrong. All right, well, that's a thought. I have other thoughts too. Uh, Anyway, what was I doing here? (laughs) And then reorient back to what you're trying to do. That's kind of the essence of of what you want to work toward with this mindfulness. And the more you practice it, you know, if you're practicing like actual mindfulness meditation frequently, you know, multiple times a week, you will get better at that. You will get more efficient at that. And you'll find that things do derail you less. Um, So I think that that's one thing that could fit in here really well. And that's what I got for you. Hopefully those thoughts are helpful to you. I think that you are doing the right thing. You just need some practice relaxing. You don't have to feel like you're, you know, uh, just a lazy couch potato. You don't even have to be a couch potato. You can have activities. You don't have to be totally aimless. But I appreciate the question because this means you're trying to think about how to be even better to yourself, which is awesome. So good luck to you. Hey, friends, the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast will be right back after this short message from our sponsor. All right. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp Online Therapy. We talk a lot about BetterHelp on the show, and this month we are discussing some of the stigmas around mental health. So one of the things that uh, drives me crazy as a therapist is the fact that a lot of people feel like uh, you need to wait till it's terrible and unbearable to go to therapy. And that's not true. Uh, Therapy is a tool to utilize when things are bad, but also before things get terrible so that you can help yourself avoid the lowest of the low. And it's perfectly valid for you to use therapy before you're at a rock bottom. Um, A lot of people also think that therapy is only for a select few who are, you know, crazy enough or impaired enough. And that's not the case. You know, going to therapy doesn't mean that something's wrong with you. It means that, you know, you recognize humans need some help sometimes, and maybe you do have a mental disorder. Maybe you don't, but you don't have to be part of a select club in order to make use of therapy. You don't have to be bad enough or anything like that. Mental health should be a part of normal life, just like taking care of your physical health. 
So definitely, I think that um, therapy is extremely useful for all of those issues. It doesn't have to be, you know, only when you're super, super struggling and things are at a rock bottom. So if you think that maybe now is the time for you to get some additional help before it gets that bad, you should check out BetterHelp. Uh, BetterHelp is customized online therapy. They offer phone, video, even live chat sessions with your therapist. So if you don't want to see anyone on camera, you don't have to. Uh, it's more affordable, it tends to be, than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours, which is extremely quick, which um, I think one thing regarding this period of time is that a lot of therapists don't have availability, they're booked out really far, and so to be able to talk to somebody quickly is a huge benefit. So give it a try, check it out, see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp Online Therapy. Since we are sponsored by BetterHelp, the hardcore self-help listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash duff. That's B-E-T-T-E-R, better help, H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash duff. All right, back to the show. All right, so on to question two. Uh, hi, Dr. Duff. Back in the fall, my partner of five years and I broke up after deliberation surrounding an open relationship. In short, I didn't want one and was taken aback when it was suggested that far into the relationship. And it really messed with my self-esteem, trust, masculinity, and mental health as a whole. However, I've been seeing someone new for the past few months, and it's been great. We have similar interests and personalities, and we support each other with our respective mental health. However, the past few weeks I've been experiencing ED, uh, erectile dysfunction, which, uh, just to clarify for you guys, erectile dysfunction means typically uh, difficulty either getting or maintaining an erection for people with a penis. Um, so, however, the past few weeks I've been experiencing ED with them, which has been further messing with my self-esteem and masculinity. I saw my primary care physician about it, who suggested that it's likely psychological and not physical, as I'm young, in my mid-20s, and healthy overall. I've also been seeing a therapist since the breakup, which has been very helpful but hasn't solved this physical problem. I purchased some generic medication for the time being, which seems to work but lowers my self-esteem thinking I have to take it. What recommendations do you have to work through this for myself and my partner? Um, so yeah, great question. Thank you for writing in. I think this is a really interesting question, and I don't think one that I've had the opportunity to answer before. So I always appreciate that. Thank you. First off, um, sorry to hear about the breakup. You know, uh, after five years, that must have been really hard for you. And it, it seems like it felt like it came out of left field a little bit here for you, which probably just adds to the difficulty. I think that it's, you know, one thing when you've been talking about opening up a relationship or exploring some form of non-monogamy, what have you, for, for a while, that would, you know, involve working through things, talking, communicating in general, all of that. But it sounds like this sort of came out of nowhere for you. And uh, that's, that's tough. And obviously, it led to a rupture in the relationship, you know, doubts on your part and all of that. And then it ended. And when that happens, you don't really get the same sense of closure. Uh, you're basically left to do sort of a post hoc interpretation. Oh my God, that's a really nerdy way of saying it. Um, you're probably left <laughs> looking back and trying to figure out what happened. That's a better way. Thank Sorry. So, you know, you're left trying to figure out what happened and, and looking back at the reasons why. And I think there are, you know, uh, coming, obviously coming from my perspective, most of you guys know that, uh, you know, I am in a, in a consensually non-monogamous relationship and, uh, well, I suppose relationships, I don't know how to term that, but, um, you know, uh, my wife and I, we, we, we see other people and I think that there are a lot of, uh, perfectly fine, legitimate reasons for doing that, for opening up a relationship, et cetera, that would not necessarily reflect poorly on you. They may not have anything to do with you, but in this case, if you never talked about them, if you never like got there together and, and you know, explored it and, and, um, had a satisfying, you know, um, approach to this, then you're just left with your own thoughts. And that can be big trouble sometimes because you're sitting there thinking about, okay, what did I do? What did I do wrong? You know, why couldn't I satisfy them? Um, was everything a lie to start with? Did they really not like me to begin with? And this was just a means to an end were they already cheating? And this is just to justify that. Is there somebody else they fell in love with? And this is just so that they can leave me you know, your thoughts can go anywhere and everywhere with that. And that's understandable, right? Without context, that's sort of what your brain has to do. But these are also definitely things that you can process and that you can work through in therapy because, you know, your your automatic negative interpretations of why what happened did 
those are likely just one possibility among many. And there may also be things that you can look back on and reinterpret to better understand how things went that way. But that's going to take some time. That's going to take some approaching rather than avoiding. And like I said, therapy is a great platform for that. I don't say all this, though, to diminish the pain and the impact of the breakup and what you experienced. Not at all. You know, you don't have any control over that necessarily. This was clearly painful and difficult for you. That's valid. However, uh, those doubts that you're talking about and, you know, those, those, those insecurities that are creeping in, those probably have to do with um, the difficulties that you're now experiencing in your current relationship. I have to assume that they're probably somewhat related. So yeah, I think that that it's it's definitely something worth considering. Now moving on from from that, I want to say that I'm super happy that you're finding success and closeness in your current relationship. That's awesome. Um, you could have easily been very closed off to the opportunity or to the possibility of that. So I'm, I'm proud of you for you know exploring that and having a good relationship so far. And it sounds like you found a good match that you guys are good supports for one another. I also want to congratulate you on checking with your primary care doctor first. It's always important to rule out physical health issues first because there are a variety of things that can contribute to erectile dysfunction. Um, you know, be that you know hormonal things like testosterone, blood pressure things, all sorts of different stuff could contribute to that. So um, good job getting that checked out. If you feel like your primary care didn't really take you seriously, you could always get a second opinion or see a specialist. Um, like if they didn't do any blood work and they just said, oh, you're probably fine, <laughs> right? Um, you might want to dig a little bit deeper into that if you if you suspect there could potentially be a physical cause. But uh, often these things are, are you know, um, psychologically impacted as well. You said that you've been seeing a therapist since the breakup, which is great. I wonder though right now, maybe if it would be time to either switch or add on a specialist like a sex therapist. So sex therapy is a specialized subfield of therapy, sort of like trauma therapy or um, people who work with individuals on the autism spectrum, whatever, right? So it's kind of a subfield of therapy. Not every therapist is skilled in doing sex therapy. Um, but for somebody who is, for somebody who is a, a sex therapist, this is one of those bread and butter issues that they would be totally used to working with. Um, and this is something they would be comfortable working with in an individual context, just with the person directly and in the context of somebody in a relationship. So whether that's individual coming in as a couple or, you know, um, coming in as an individual and focusing just on yourself or on the relationship, all of those are valid. And as I said, a sex therapist would be totally comfortable working with something like this and have techniques and, and the ability to do something about it likely. Um, honestly, I, I have to imagine there's probably a good chance that you've already started to make some progress on this since you wrote it in, since you wrote the question in. Um, it's been a few months since you and your current partner, hopefully they're still your current partner, um, but it's been a few months since you started seeing each other and you may simply just need time to adjust, uh, time to grieve the past relationship still and to break some of the negative associations that you have to that previous relationship. There can be a little bit of a lag in the healing too, even if it's been a long time uh, since the breakup, but you're not, you weren't really actively dating or seeing somebody or having, you know, physical connections with somebody during that period of time, then it's sort of like the, the opportunity to heal and have a corrective experience is on pause because you weren't really in the midst of it. So, you know, there could be a little bit of a delay there and you may find yourself in a position where you're still trying to break down those negative associations you have toward things like sex and relationships. Uh, you do need to go easy on yourself about the medication. I hear a lot of shame related to that. Like, oh, you did something wrong and that's why you need the medication or you're not masculine enough. So, you know, you need the medication. Uh, you know, you wouldn't be saying that if it were medication for asthma, right? Or diabetes or something like that. Um, just because it's it's related to this thing, sex, that's very important to a lot of us. It, it has a different tone to it, but it doesn't need to. There's absolutely no shame in using medication, long-term or short-term. And I think that your partner should take that even as a compliment, right? That they are important enough for you to go on medication to facilitate your sexual relationship. That's pretty awesome. That's like, that's like a big leap and it's not convenient for you and you're willing to do that. So I think that's cool. Um, but let's talk about sort of why this is happening. When it comes to erectile dysfunction um, and when we're looking at psychological reasons for it, it's most often tied to anxiety. Um, sometimes it's performance anxiety. And then sometimes you get this thing where it happens randomly, like for no particular reason you weren't expecting it to, but you have an encounter 
and you realize, oh, uh, that's not working, <laughs> right? And then there's basically the second layer of anxiety that comes in where you're so worried about not being able to get it up that you can't get it up, right? So you get in your head about it and you're so concerned that you freak yourself out and then it's not going to happen. So one thing that you can do is work with your partner on this. Um, I, I don't know what their awareness is, but do they know it's been an issue for you or have you kept it pretty well hidden with your medications and such? Um, it's your choice. You know, this is your body we're talking about here, but being open about it, it can be helpful for um, them to interpret what they see from you, right? So they understand what's going on and not misinterpreting that. Um, and also so that they can be on your side and work with you on it. For instance, one thing that you can do is work to expand your definition of sex. In a lot of relationships, we see uh, a really heavy focus on penetrative sex involving, you know, a penis. And um, that's like the main focus of it. And so it's no wonder that performance anxiety can take hold because when you're, you know, the one, you know, with the penis in this situation and you're relied upon to provide that penetration with it, it's like, okay, here we go. You got to get it up. You need to perform well enough and long enough to be satisfying, but also you need to make sure that you orgasm at the perfect time. Like there's a lot of things that can cause like performance anxiety, stage fright. You can really get in your head about it. Um, obviously there are a ton of different influences to this, right? Um, everything from, you know, uh, having an inappropriate uh, relationship to pornography. When I say that, I don't mean like porn is evil, but like you taking taking that as fact in the same way that you would take like a rom-com as fact for how love should work right um it's it's entertainment it's not instructional um there are societal pressures you know obviously things depending on where you live there's um gosh i mean religious things there's there's all sorts of potential influences here but all i'm trying to say is it can be a lot of pressure and that makes sense so when I say that you can work on expanding your definition of what sex is, that means that you can do things like focus more on oral sex, um, heavy petting, caressing, you know, other forms of intimacy that don't even require becoming erect. And with that, you can also work on trying to be less perfectionistic, right? So one thing that, that often happens is there's the sensitivity like I talked about, right? You're worried that you're not going to be able to get erect or you're not going to be able to maintain an erection or something like that. And so uh, you attempt to have, you know, penetrative sex and you find that it's not working out. What happens a lot of times is you're like, God, oh, I knew it. Here it goes again, right? So you slump your shoulders, you quit the whole session, you're, you're, you lost the mood anyway, like you're not happy with yourself, you're depressed, all of that stuff. Um, it doesn't have to be that way, right? You can attempt and if it doesn't work out the way you're expecting, you don't have to stop. You can always come back to it or not, right? In a situation like this, you could just slow down a little. Be like, okay, that route isn't working. Um, that's okay. There's other forms of intimacy. And so you focus more on those. You know, even if that's just kissing, cuddling, things of that sort, uh, you may find that if you're able to be present, you know, present focus and in the moment and enjoying these other things, when your mind is off the objective of it, you know, when you're not thinking about the goal and all this stuff we were just saying, you might get the happy surprise of an erection, right? And if that happens, then you can capitalize on it. Just go for it. And if not, then you enjoy the process. You enjoy the company. You enjoy the other sensations and the wide umbrella of what sex actually is. Um, there's a type of work in sex therapy that that's often used, which is called sensate focus. And this is what a, a technique you use where you actually, um, you, you intentionally make the rule that you are not allowed to have penetrative sex, at least at first, right? So you go through kind of a protocol of, 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 you know, sessions over time with your partner. And so for the whole first session, you only focus on what we tend to think of as, you know, less intense activities, though they don't have to be less intense. Um, but, uh, things like kissing, you know, touching, caressing, keeping it very, very light. And depending on how intense the protocol is that the, that the provider is using, um, they may go through session by session and only add teeny little bits, right? So from the first one, you just have maybe touching and kissing and, you know, nothing in like the genital or erogenous zones. 
aside from like the mouth, right? Um, and then the next time you're allowed to do more heavy petting, you're allowed to touch genitals, you're allowed to touch boobs or, you know, penis over the pants, whatever, different things like that. Um, and then next you're allowed to remove your clothes and then next you can integrate uh, oral or, you know, mouth on different parts of the, of the body, whatever, you know, you can go as slow as you want to. Um, and what you do is you slowly work your way up and you focus on really trying to get a lot out of each sensation, each session, and you focus on the sensations of it, right? That's why it's called sensate focus. It's not like you're just trying to, um, you know, knock it out and get it done and just spend that time. You're supposed to try to focus on being really present, enjoying all of the different sensations and things that you might be doing with your partner, um, things that you don't necessarily give as much attention to potentially in, in at other times, and you work your way through bit by bit. Um, and by the end of it, a lot of people are surprised about how many issues can kind of spontaneously resolve just by taking it slow and, and allowing that buildup. And uh, sometimes people don't make it all the way to the end because they're like, oh my God, I'm dying. Can we just do it now? <laughs> right? Which, you know, if that works, then problem solved. But um, it, it's it's technique that that does often work for people. And there are certainly guides to doing this that you can find online or in workbooks. But as I said, one of the best things you could do here would be to enlist the help of a sex therapist. And just like the medication, don't feel like you did something wrong to enlist the help of a sex therapist. Like this should be a compliment to your partner. It should be a compliment to yourself. Like this is important enough for you to pay attention to it. And you're not going to be with a sex therapist for your entire life, likely. This is just something that you're using to, um, you know, focus on yourself. It's a tool that you have at your disposal. And I think it's powerful for you to be able to recognize that and do something about it. You're already clearly open to the idea of therapy, which is awesome, and this would help with this specific issue. So I think that um, that's basically what I have for you. Um, some ideas here, some ways that you can, you know, think about it a little bit differently, ways you could change your approach, additional help that you can get. There's a lot that can be done here. So I really, really appreciate you bringing this up, the vulnerability, and the great question. Uh, you got this. So thanks for that. Uh, and with that, that is the end of the episode, guys. This has been episode 286, <laughs> episode 286 of the Hardcore Self-Help Podcast. If you want to send me in a question, again, send it to duffthepsych at gmail.com. Uh, if you would like to check out the show notes, go to duffthepsych.com slash episode 286. On the website, I have all my old episodes. So if you want to go back to episode one, you can do that. Um, I know that the podcast players only have often the most recent ones. So if you want to dig deeper, use the search bar for topics on my website and see if something strikes your fancy. Um, and I hope that you guys have a really good rest of your week. I will see you for the next episode. Bye.